There are so many ways to express your artistic voice in your quilts. Today on Quilting Arts, stitch your statement. Quilting Arts has been made possible in part by Bernina of America, LLC. Bernina, made to create. Bernina.com. Innova. Innova Long Arm Quilting Systems, built to quilt. InnovaLongArm.com. Havel Sewing. Cut to the point. HavelSewing.com. host Susan Brubaker Knapp. Thank you for joining us and welcome to this new season of Quilting Arts. Whatever you create, especially through fiber art and quilting, express your own artistic voice. This season, some of today's most creative fiber artists will challenge and inspire you to find that voice as they share their own style. Join us and see how to tell your story through fabrics, stitches, paints, transfers, and embellishments. On this first episode, stitches proclaim the message. It's how you use those stitches that make the artistic statement. In the hands of fiber artist Lee McComas, stitches are used almost like paint to tell her story. She is here to explore how far she can go with these basic elements to create compelling images. Then, art quilter Laura Wazalowski uses stitches in a different way to enhance her quilts. Using free stitched embroideries, she creates a quilt narrative that reflects her joyful and colorful life. Let's join Lee for some thread painting. Fiber artist Lee McComas blends threads in a really beautiful way to, to create realism in her work. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, so you're going to teach here. us how to do that. That's right. Okay. And um, today what we're going to focus on are some concepts of edges, hard mm. and soft edges. Okay. So when I'm doing my portrait quilt, I started by doing this fused raw edge applique. And this is an example I, of a portrait I did of my stepdaughter, Maya. And, um, and when I finished with a portrait like this, I, there's something about it, it's kind of contemporary, you can use mm -hmm. fun colors, but it's always bothered me that it has these very hard edges where you shift from one fabric to the other. Even when the values are pretty similar too, you still yeah. have those. Yeah, yeah. and um, sometimes that's okay, it's kind of very Andy Warhol, but I wanted to create something that was a little more realistic mm -hmm. and, and had more subtle shading and definition. So I knew that I needed to find a way to get rid of all the hard edges and to create some soft edges. And that's where I went to my artist friends who are not quilters and they're painters. And my husband is a classically trained artist. He does beautiful portrait and figurative work with oil paints. And so he talked me through this concept. My challenge was to learn how to do that with the medium that I work in. And I work almost exclusively with just fabric and thread. And I do know quilters that incorporate uh, printing and and paint and inks to try and soften those edges. And I could go that direction. I think that could be kind of fun, but somehow I got hooked on this idea of doing it just with thread. Yeah, it's a and real so challenge. It is, yeah. and I'm trying to push that as far as I can. So, what you want to do is begin to blend your threads as you move from here. And here is an example of how mm. I did this. Actually, these two pieces were exactly the same when I finished with the first phase of it, but then I stitched over this. But now do you have these pieces edges. of fabric fused down underneath this as well? Yeah. You do? Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. And so you can see how I've tried to erase or blend those very, very hard yeah, lines. Yeah, you've completely erased. Yeah. And the trick is to create these transition zones where um, 
one set of threads blend with another mm. set of threads. And so you can eliminate those really hard lines. And you can see on a portrait like this, there are places here in the forehead where you've got a really wide area that you can create those transitions. This very, very lightest, I call it my number one value, can, can stitch way over and cross over into this number two value. And then this number two value can stitch over into this number one value and really blur these edges. Some places it happens much quicker and that's along the edge of the face. You can see that this value value changes very quickly and that's because the face is falling away and into shadow mm -hmm. and when that happens it creates what's called a form shadow and you move from light into darkness because the form of the object that you're defining in this case the forehead is curved and it's just falling out of the light so you're doing that right over in here yeah yeah and in that case you've got a transition from one value to another pretty quickly mm -hmm. and so those transition zones become really so narrow. So you were talking about this yeah. in some places it's long like this and in some mm -hmm. places it's more it's like, like this. this okay and then some places you do still want to maintain a hard edge mm -hmm. and that's where it becomes like this so on this yeah. piece, can you talk about, I see what you're talking about here where the, the values are very close together in this mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. Are there other places on here where there's a real, like a, I guess you fat, you go faster right to that? Yeah, you'll do that. Now look at uh, the white of her eye. Okay. Okay, that's a hard edge because the, the white of your eye ends. It doesn't blend into your eyelid. So you need to have some sharp edges there. Okay. Um, and right along here, obviously, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, yeah. So what I want to do is just show an example or an exercise that I do with students when I'm teaching them how to blend those threads. Okay. And so what I'm going to work with is a panel like this. And what I've done is drawn, I start with a solid line down the middle and I draw two more solid lines off to each side. Mm -hmm. And then I put some dotted lines down the middle. So it looks like, looks a, four, like a four lane highway. Four. Yeah. Yeah, and what I'm gonna do is start with one color on one side of this just practice panel, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna stitch back and forth, and that's my first thread. Okay. But I don't wanna pivot at the same place all of the time. So about 25% of my lines are gonna come up to this first dotted line, and then I'm gonna go back. Mm -hmm. And 25% of the time, I'm gonna come to the middle line and go back. Another 25 are gonna come all the way over here to this third line, and. The last 25 are going to come all the way across. Okay. So all of my stitch lines are going to cover this area. But then it's going to fade out more on the it's left It's going to fade side. as you get to the other side. So I'm going to take this over to the machine Great. and kind of show you how I stitch that. Okay. Oh, one other thing to mention, though, is I start wide and I went narrow. And that gives me some practice having that wide transition and then moving into Just a narrow area. transition okay. Okay. area. Bring this down, get my tails out of the way, and I'm just going to start stitching. I'm going to anchor it, and I'm going to go to the first area, and the next area, and the third area. You've got area. your feet dogs down. This is all free motion. This is free motion. It's hard on a little piece like that because it's hard to get it a grip is. on it, right? Yeah. Now, something I'm doing, I went short, medium, long, longest, mm -hmm. and then I worked my way back. Oh, but you okay. don't want to do that because you're trying to erase any kind of pattern that might show up. Okay. So after look, I've like done like a that. Chart, like a chart. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to go short. I'm going to go kind of long. I'm going to go really long. I'm going to come back and go really short and try and not create a repetitive pattern. And so in, as you look at this, you can see that I'm not really filling it in really close. If, if I'm kind of loose and spread out, I might come back across and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I'll keep going till I get to the end. But I'm going to stop right here and change the thread colors. Okay. And show you how the second thread is going to blend in. All right. Now I'm going to turn this around and I'm going to work back across using a blue thread. And I should mention that I don't really stitch portraits with red and blue thread, <laughs> that I've chosen those colors today so that you can see the stitching and you can right. see a contrast with the threads. All right, so here we go. So now I'm gonna come back through with the blue thread, doing the same thing, sometimes stitching all the way across, sometimes not. 
And it's a little easier this time. I'm gonna pick up that edge because as you're stitching, you're trying to fill in you're covering some of up those. Some of that yeah, you're covering up some of that those white areas. Now that's really easy to see when where those gaps are as I'm stitching here because it's red and blue thread on a white background. When I'm stitching my portraits, I've already got layers of fabric that are kind of the color that I need. And so the stitching doesn't have to be as dense and as solid as you think. Oop, I'm gonna go back here and stitch that. I'm gonna stitch in. Yeah. So I would keep going with that okay. and I would finish the blue all the way across. Mm -hmm. And through the magic of television, I have, have a finished one. one? Yes, okay. I do. I have a finished one here, so you can see how the blue and the red come together. Now, do you think a lot about your stitch length when you're doing this? You know, because I, in some places in your work, your stitches are long, really long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I don't. Mm -hmm. So what I do is once I've dropped the feed dogs then it's all up to me how fast I move. When I've got a really broad transition zone or I'm doing a wide open space, mm -hmm. I stitch like I drive down the highway, like <laughs> 80 miles an hour <laughs> if I don't think I'm gonna get caught. But then I have to slow down when I'm doing narrower transition zones or if there's some detail. And I do a lot of that. If we can take a look at back at Maya where I've stitched on her cheek because I use those long graceful stitch lines to help give that feeling of that smooth flowing cheek. And, and you've created the contours. You haven't gone straight across mm -hmm. here. You've created the contours, the shape, mm -hmm. the curves. Yeah. The stitch lines are going like this rather than straight across, which yeah. is really important too. And that was something I had to learn because when I first started thread painting and I read what other artists were doing, that was... Um, um, that was the standard advice is that you should go in the same direction all the time and I mm. didn't like it right. so I've changed that I don't do it one of the problems that it does create is you tend to get a little bit of warping if you're mm. not careful and um, you can press that out you can block it and you're so using a stabilizer also in your work, I do right? I use a stabilizer that helps when I'm done I spray this with water and then I press it down mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that helps is when you're doing those curves the longer stitches means you've you've punctured the work less often and I think that also helps to keep it flatter yeah now we so. have about a minute left, okay. and I want to spend some time talking yes. about this beautiful piece. Let's talk about, this is my nephew Jake, mm -hmm. and he's very being very contemplative mm. in this, in this photo that was taken of him. But he's a good example of places where you can blend the threads as you move from light into the dark. Uh, there are places though when you have what's called a cast shadow and those are one of the areas where you have those hard lines or very abrupt changes in thread. Mm -hmm. And some good examples of that, always the nostril. The nostril is dark because that nostril flare, which is this, this rounded part of your nose, is blocking the light mm. from the inside of your nose. Also a place where that's happening with Jake is he's holding his hand up next to his face and it creates a shadow. Oh right, so that's his thumb creating a dark shadow yeah, against his chin. Yeah, down into his chin and his neck. So that's a cast shadow and those have very strong edges. Mm -hmm. Another place over here is maybe his earlobe. His ear casts a shadow on the, the back part of his neck and so that becomes very abrupt. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, it's just lovely. Thank you so much. You bet. Coming up next, Laura Wazalowski freely stitches embroideries to tell her story. Laura Wazalowski is here with some beautiful little embroideries you've been doing lately. Thank you, Susan. It's great to be here. Um, I brought in a few that I had made many, many years ago. These are all hand embroidered. There's no marking of the fabric or anything mm -hmm. like that. These are older. These were done on two layers of black cotton, mm. and they're really intensely stitched, yes. sort of free stitched. Um, but I've started working on wool now because mm. it's a lot easier on your hands, for one thing. Mm -hmm. And I also like the texture that you get with the wool fabric in the background and then the pearl cotton thread on top. So I thought I'd show you how I go about making something like this. Like oh, I'd this love to see hair. that. Oh, great. So what you need to start out with, of course, is sort of a canvas, a base fabric like this. Mm -hmm. This um, used to be a vest, a boiled oh, wool vest that uh -huh. I got in a resale shop, but I took it home, washed it, and made it, felted it up a little bit. By you, putting it in really hot water, right? Right. And then in the dryer. Agitating it in the washing machine and then drying it. Um, I don't want it really 
you know, I felt it a lot because that's even hard to stitch mm. through. So it has a little stitch, a uh, little stretch to it like that. And I love the color. <laughs> Isn't that mm -hmm. green wonderful? It is. It's celery. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's a nice way to put it. <laughs> and then what I do is I decide on what type of object I want to do. So in this case, it was a pear shape. Now, um, I don't mark the fabric in any way. I just take a long running stitch. I'm using a size 5 pearl cotton here. Mm -hmm. And that size, size 5 pearl cotton is in a size 3 embroidery needle. And what I'm going to do is just kind of run along here and sketch out the shape of my pear with that running stitch. Okay. I want a contrasting color um, so that I can see, you know, where and the And it's so edges. nice that it's variegated, too. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> but I'm going to end up taking that out later on. So oh. I'll end up with a shape like this. There's my pear shape. Okay. And now I'm going to fill it in. Now, when I fill it in, I'm doing different stitch combinations. You can see there's a needle weaving. There's something with a blanket stitch, a lot of French knots like that. Mm -hmm. So I'll come up with some stitch combinations that I'm going to fill in that shape with. And it's at random. Um, it's free stitched, you know. I don't know what I'm going to do. Just fun. Yeah. So there's my pear shape. And then I use um, this variegated thread that I've dyed. I'm using mostly a size 8 pearl cotton. Mm -hmm. And um, I always match that with a size 4 or 3 embroidery needle. Okay. So um, I brought you a needle chart. It's on the back of oh, my okay. business Thank card you. in case you need to know what needle goes with what What a nice thread. little guide, yeah. Well, anytime. <laughs> Anything for you, Susan. <laughs> so let me show you needle weaving, because that's the fun one. Yeah, it looks so nice. It looks almost like burlap. It does, doesn't yeah. it? It's got a great texture to it. And with a variegated thread, you get this nice texture like that. Oh, right. So what you need to do in needle weaving, of course, is to make the warp, the longer um, threads like that. So I'm taking really long stitches. You see that? Mm -hmm. Really long stitches like that. And then I'm going to weave across with my needle. But when I weave across, I'm using the back of the needle. Oh, not smart. the point. Yeah. So I'm going over, under, over, under, just like you would weave a piece of fabric. Mm -hmm. So it's going through like that. And with the blunt end, you don't catch that pointed part in the wool or in the thread. That's right. Yeah. And it's and it goes in like that. And then I'll go down all the way to the back. And then when I come up, I'm coming up right next to where I went down. Oh, okay. Like that. And then I'm going to weave across again with that blunt end. So by again. putting it down through the fabric, you're kind of stabilizing it until yes. so it doesn't start to stretch in on itself. That's right. You want to anchor it so that it doesn't, yeah, exactly. It keeps it nice and squared up. So I'm doing the opposite now, under, over, under, over. And I'll use the needle to sort of tamp it down like the beater mm -hmm. on, a, on a loom. Pull that through, and then I'll do the same thing over here. Go all the way down and continue on weaving back and forth like that. And you end up with this great texture like and that. And it's great. Again, with the variegated, it just makes it so much more special. And it doesn't have to be a rectangle. You can make it shaped. Some of these have a little bit more of a shape to it. Can oh, you see okay. that one? Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, another kind of stitch, let me move these out of the way a little bit. Another stitch that I like uh, playing with a lot is this outline stitch right here. Mm -hmm. And that shows a lot of the background fabric. So an outline stitch is real simple. Again, you're up on top of the fabric like that, and you're going to do sort of this back stitch or outline stitch like that. And you can make straight lines or curved lines. You're always going back towards where you came out in the first place. And, and you're grabbing that thread with your thumb and pulling it off to the side. Too. I am. And I put my thumb down on top a lot so that I don't tangle things up. Because it's easy to get that's threads. That's how you stained. go so fast. Yeah, just like that. So that's another kind of stitch you could use. I have a few other ones I'll show you. Mm -hmm. This one here is a blanket stitch. You recognize it's pretty mm -hmm. simple to do. Right. Um, so if I do a blanket stitch, I'm going horizontal. I'm going vertically like that, and I make these little teeth that go out to the edge. The needle goes under. I mean, the needle goes on, on top, top of the thread, okay. and then when you pull it out. But what I want to do is go back and close off that blanket stitch so I can make little squares. So let me show you. This is what I so mean. So you're almost like making a ladder. That's right. Okay. I'm going to go back and forth and back and forth. So I went down. I Now I'm coming up at the edge of my teeth, mm -hmm. on the edge of my teeth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm going to go backwards with the blanket stitch. So there's my vertical. There's my little horizontal like that. And see what I'm doing? I'm making little boxes. I'm closing them oh, off like okay. that. So that gives a really neat sort of texture, I guess, or a little um, shape like that. I'll continue on. And then when I'm all done, what I can do is go back and fill in those little squares with um, French knots. And I've chosen a green, this is called peas in a pod, this colorway. <laughs> uh, peas in a pod colorway, and I'll wrap it one, 
two, three like that, and go down. And I'm just putting French knots in the center. So when you look at the pair, you'll see it over here. There it is, there's oh, that right. blanket stitch with the French knots. It doesn't have to be square. Again, you can make circular ones, um, odd shaped ones like that. Beautiful. So that's a neat stitch combination. I really like that one a lot. Mm -hmm. I've been using that one a lot. Um, to fill in some of the areas, um, let me see, right here, even up here on the top of the pair, the, mm -hmm. stem, the stem, and over here, you'll see a satin stitch. Satin stitches are placed uh, there, um, straight stitches that are placed really close together. So I'm going to go right next to my other straight stitch. And I'll build up this, oops, I came undone there, but I'll build up this kind of heavy, line of stitching that way. So it completely covers the background and makes a nice that's solid right. color with the thread. That's right, yeah, thing. and it fills it in really neat like that. So that's another idea. Or, you know, there's so many embroidery stitches out there, it'd be great to come up with oh, dozens of these kind of variations. But I like working with this, um, it's called a Lazy Daisy stitch, mm -hmm. and it gives this kind of loopy kind of texture. So with Lazy Daisy, there you are up on top, your needle goes in right next to where you came out, and you go about a quarter of an inch and make sure the thread's underneath the needle. When you pull it up like that, then you drop the needle is on the other side of that loop. So it's a looping stitch. Okay. And that thread. And that one down now locks it in. Yeah, yeah, that'll lock it in so that you end up with a whole bunch of loops right next to each other. And maybe you can show us how you do, can you actually do like a little flower with that? Is that what that well, comes sure. from? Well, sure, you yeah. could certainly do that. You could kind of rotate it. Mm -hmm. So you're always coming back to that center point. I suppose that's why it's called Lazy Daisy, Maybe. right? Because you're... It looks like it, petals or They leaves. look like yeah. petals, yeah. So you could do almost anything. So I'm back at that center again, and I'm going to go out like that. But I'll do it... A lot of times, I'll do it in lines. So I'm making... I would continue to go around mm -hmm. like that for the Lazy Daisy, to make a daisy. But I'll, I'll do it in lines like that. And then I'll take another thread color, and maybe I'll do that outline stitch down the center. So I'm combining different stitches. There's my outline stitch going down the center and breaking up those two rows of lazy daisies like that. It's fun. It's I mean, very improvisational too because you're is. kind of making it up as you go along. And if you don't like something, you take it out. Mm -hmm. It's very forgiving. So here, let me make one down here. This is called the chain stitch. Now the chain stitch, you can make shapes like mm. that. Mm -hmm. So I've got it over here. Let me look on the pair right there. There oh, it right, is. Right. So the chain stitch is there. So again, I've made sort of a lazy daisy, but then instead of going all, taking my thread all the way through, I'm gonna go back on that side. Let me try it one more time so you can see. There it is. So you're holding the thread out of the, out of the way on the side. Out of the way, and my needle is actually going inside the loop rather okay. than outside. And I'm just going a quarter of an inch or so, make sure the thread's underneath like that. And you continue on like that. So you can make shapes with your chain stitch on like that. There, there must be hundreds of thousands, of, well, maybe not that many, a lot of combinations. Right, lots but, of stitches and lots of combinations. Yeah. So what are you thinking about as you decide this? Do, mm -hmm. you, ha, do you, it looks like you've tried to spread out some of the colors, the darker values. Exactly. And those kinds of things too. Yeah, I wanna break up, they're kind of the colors and the textures, I wanna break it up. It's sort of like a patchwork mm -hmm. quilt in a way. And also I wanna make sure that I, um, you know, if I have yellow up here, I over, have it over here and over there, I repeat the color. I repeat repeat the stitch combination around the piece. But like the that. same basic design principles that you would use in anything come into play here too. I'm exactly. noticing that you've got not as dense stitching in your background mm -hmm. so that this is really the focal point because all right. of the interest is there. That's right? right. So when you're done with the focal point and you're done with all that, then I go around it with an outline stitch again. So that's what I'm doing here. Oh, okay. I'm going right next to all those um, combinations and and whatever I've made there. And I'm using that outline stitch to, to kind of trim up the edge. And then later on, when I do all the outline, then I'm gonna go back, or before I go the outline mm -hmm. around the leaf here, I'm gonna pull these out. Okay. I'm gonna get rid of those. So Be that's just a guideline. It's almost like a mm -hmm. little lightly sketched line so that you know exactly. where you're working. It's a stitch sketch. And do you do it that way rather than marking it with something? It would be really hard to mark the wool, I would oh, think. Right, it right. just would rub off or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, so I've outlined, here I've outlined it with a yellow. And and then I fill in the back with, that's a running stitch. These are cross stitches down here with French knots inside. Oh, okay. Um, around the edges of this one and that one, what I did was a, a blanket stitch. And then, I don't know if you can see this, that blue line it, there. Oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah, I just whip stitched.
stitched around that with oh, a blue okay. thread. So after you did the blanket stitch, you went back and just embellished a little bit with a darker blue. That's right, yeah. Gorgeous. And the other thing that's so nice about some of your pieces mm -hmm. is that you've got these irregular edges, which yeah. is so charming. I know. This is going to be oddly shaped, too. But it all came from that green wool, boiled wool, mm -hmm. and using the, the hand-dyed pearl cottons on top. So, um, and this one down here, I don't know if you can see that, but this is couch number oh, three, right. size number three. That's a heavier thread like that. So I use a lot of um, uh, pearl cottons. I use a three, the five, the eight, and this back here is a size 12. So again, you would match the needle with the thread, the embroidery needle with the and, thread. And here again, you've used mm -hmm. the lighter weight in your background so that it's a little bit flatter and the tree is standing out because you use the heavier That's thread, right? right? Yeah. 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 So you start with a very simple, you know, object or a simple scene and just go crazy with all the stitching that you do on well, top it's, of them. They're just charming, really, and so look much. like a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Well, today we've had two wonderful artists and two totally different ways of stitching. And next time we'll be back to throw some paint into the mix. Listen to the voices of the past as you explore your own quilt art when you make time for contemporary quilting every day. Make time for contemporary quilting every day. Visit our website, quiltingartstv.com, for access to selected project instructions, ideas, tips and techniques from this season of Quilting Arts TV. This is show 1701. More art quilting inspiration is available in Quilting Arts Magazine, a one-year subscription with six issues plus the four DVD set with all 13 episodes of Quilting Arts TV Series 1700 is available for $39.99. To order, visit quiltingartstv.com offer. Quilting Arts has been made possible in part by Bernina of America, LLC. Bernina, made to create. Bernina.com. Innova. Innova long arm quilting systems, built to quilt. InnovaLongArm.com. Havel Sewing. Cut to the point. HavelSewing.com Take your contemporary quilting to the next level. Visit quiltingartstv.com for your free e-booklet featuring some of the great tips and techniques shown on Quilting Arts TV.